Hello, readers. Coming up, it's episode number 218 with Alex Zaitchik on Owning the Sun. First, though, I wanted to remind you to check out our website at booksonpod.com. While there, you can sort through past shows by episode number, book title, author's last name, or sort by category. For instance, select the current events and politics, history, or science and medicine category for episode number 125 with Gerald Posner on Pharma. This is Gerald Posner, author of Pharma, Greed, Lies, and the Poisoning of America. And you're listening to Books on Pod with Trey Elling. Hello, readers. Alexander Zaitchik is an independent investigative journalist and published author. His newest book is titled Owning the Sun, a people's history of monopoly medicine from aspirin to COVID-19 vaccines. Alex, thank you so much for the time. How are you doing today? I'm good. Good to be here. Thanks for having me. It's my pleasure. So what was your goal with this book? Uh, well, I, honestly, it started out uh, as a personal uh, goal of trying to understand this history myself because it it's not something that was really um, uh, done before. Um, there wasn't a sort of single volume go-to history of the rise of this very peculiar phenomenon of, of monopoly medicine. It had been sort of compartmentalized and done piecemeal by academics and scholars of medicine and the pharmaceutical industry. Um, but, you know, decade by decade, and you sort of had to piece it together. So it started off by just being very curious about how we got here, writing about drug pricing and drug politics um, in recent years sort of led me back to try to, you know, follow the threads to see um, what, what the whole picture looks like. And, um, and then once I sort of started to get a fuller sense of that history, I, I wanted to convey it in a way that was not so intimidating um, to a general reader, which, you know, uh, the industry is very good at making people afraid of uh, pharma politics and and um, monopoly economics because it's too complicated. It's you know something that they couldn't possibly understand the necessity for patent monopolies to drive innovation, et cetera, et cetera. But in fact, it's not that complicated. And then once I understood sort of how simple um, the story in the narrative, sort of the frame of the narrative was, then it became a question of how to um, sort of popularize the story in a way that uh, was readable. How much of this was fueled by what has happened with COVID-19, the subsequent vaccines over the last two years? Well, I started writing about pharma uh, in about 2016, 2017, a little bit before the pandemic. But when the pandemic hit, it was clear that those same sets of issues that were in play with insulin, with uh, so many drugs, uh, pricing scandals, um, you know, outrage, populist anger over the cost of drugs and confusion over why that was, um, were now in play in the pandemic and they were gonna be supercharged. It was clear that federal money was gonna flood into pandemic related research. And the companies were going to take that money with open arms with the expectation that there would be no pricing um, expectations attached to that money. There'd be no social obligations of any sort. They would just do what they always do, which is take the subsidy and then turn the result into a private monopoly and gouge uh, the American people while restricting science that could be exploited to the benefit of the rest of the world, which is exactly what happened. So in exploring the history, and we'll certainly get more into that a little bit later, but in exploring, exploring the history of medical patents, uh, this concept actually really began in late Renaissance Italy. The first political fallouts from patents happened in 15th century England, starting with Elizabeth I and boiling to a head during the reign of King James I. The U.S. Constitution actually addressed patents with a single line of text known as the Intellectual Property Clause that empowered Congress to, quote, promote the progress of science and useful arts by securing for limited times to authors and inventors the exclusive rights to the respective writings and discoverings. Benjamin Franklin was amongst the opponents to the idea of intellectual property, which is obviously important because he was one of the great inventors of that time. What was his reasoning for being against these things? Well, he started with the assumption uh, 
that there was no such thing as an invention. He thought that was a ludicrous idea. As a scientist, as someone who was constantly reading and incorporating the ideas of other scientists publishing in the first scientific journals of his time, he didn't buy the idea that anyone could claim a piece of knowledge or an invention as their own. He just thought that was spurious. Um, and then if it was allowed, he thought that the function of that patent would not be to spur innovation, but rather to block it and impede it, because it would limit the ability of others to employ that knowledge or technology or whatever it may be. Um, and this was actually a very common position during the Enlightenment and during the early American Republic. Adam Smith, John Locke, a lot of the sort of classic figures we associate with you know, the birth of capitalism, they, they were deeply skeptical of patent monopolies and the idea of, of claiming knowledge as property. Um, they were not fans of extending this idea of pro private property and um, liberty to the claiming of intellectual uh, property. That, that term didn't make sense to them. Um, and we can get into to why they were wary of it, but it was really an intellectual problem. They just they, they didn't see knowledge as similar to hard property of the sort that John Locke and Adam Smith were writing about. Um, they were talking about, you know, land. They were talking about actual machines or money, whatever it may be. But um, it, was a, it was a stretch to apply that to ideas. And most of the leading thinkers of the time thought it was a dangerous stretch. And most countries in Europe continued to have this debate well through the 19th century. Um, the United States and Britain were sort of the outliers. They were the first countries to really adopt a patent system um, and, and maintain it central to their, to their legal systems. Where in Europe, it wasn't until the last country was Holland in 1912, just to give you a sense of how long that debate stretched out, where people ex finally accepted this concept of intellectual property. Why was the U.S. one of, if not the first country, to really allow medical products to be patented in mass? That is a good question. Um, the British system that the U.S. system was based on did not, as a matter of custom in English common law, allow the patenting of medical products. They allowed the patenting of medical processes to make medical products. If you made a machine that could produce a medicine, you could patent that. But the custom was inherited from this enlightenment tradition, one that we just talked about, the sort of age of reason idea. And also before that, you had a very deeply religious conception of knowledge as a gift from God. And that was kind of secularized in the age of reason, but the British system inherited this, this very deep understanding of as a universal gift of the mind of God. And the idea that you would claim some idea or piece of scientific knowledge um, was considered a kind of sacrilege. And also just as a practical matter, you have to remember that for a long time, there was not a whole lot of effective medicine uh, in <laughs> you know, the pharmacopa that was used. It was pretty limited. You know, we were still leeching and bleeding for a long time. So the idea that you would try to claim and restrict the use of something that actually worked was, you know, outrageous. You know, you why would you stop humanity from benefiting some one of the few things that actually relieved suffering and extended life? So it made sense that you want this stuff to diffuse and spread, not restricted. And the U.S. inherited this tradition, and for a long time, they also did not respect patents. Um, the medical establishment, the pharmaceutical industry did not allow for patented medicines to be prescribed. Um, only the sort of, you know, cure-all um, nostrums, that industry was considered the patent medicine industry, but it was kind of a joke. It's the stuff they sold off the back of a, a wagon with, you know, the traveling actors and troops. But the serious medical establishment, the serious ethical drug makers that were called, who employed the latest scientific ideas and, and practiced what they called scientific medicine beginning in the 1870s, um, they would 
expel you from the world of medicine and pharmacy if you had tried to patent something. Um, one, they wouldn't recognize the patent. Two, you would be expelled. And that changed in the US when the German firms arrived in the 1880s and 1890s. And they had some of the first real breakthrough um, over-the-counter drugs that were scientific based. They weren't, you could, they couldn't be dismissed as, you know, PT Barnum castor oils. These were real medicines. And they took advantage of the US patent system, which had a technical uh, carve out where you could patent medicines, even though it wasn't done. And they, they won patents. And at first they were um, excoriated for this, but they persisted. And they basically pressed a template for the US drug companies to start imitating them beginning in the 20th century early and then the middle of the decades of the 20th century when big pharma really comes into its own. But it wasn't until the 1890s that drug patents in the US were, were considered even a subject for reasonable debate among doctors and, and pharmaceutical companies. Um, and the conflicts, we can talk about them, but they were they were serious and they included a massive, uh, when I talk about uh, one of the chapters in the book talks about the aspirin and uh, finessing smuggling operation that was um, put in place against one of the German patents, the Bayer patents in the 1890s and early 1900s. Um, you know, everyone got behind it pretty much, uh, except Bayer's American lawyers and the US courts, it turned out. Um, but you know, everyone thought it was just outrageous, and uh, it was it was still against the dominant ethical frame of of the century. That's right, aspirin, which was a derivative of willow leaf tea, that is one of the chemicals that the German chemical industry ends up patenting in the U.S. It leads to a black market for aspirin. Uh, I'm guessing some of the uh, the consequences of that were as dire as uh, some of what we see with the black market for drugs in, in modern times too? Uh, yeah, that's actually what led to the downfall of the um, very widespread protest, organized protest against the patent was um, some uh, safety um, issues, which led to some deaths. There was some cutting material used uh, that led to deaths and was picked up in the uh, muckraking journals of the day and actually was the main reason behind, together with uh, Upton Sinclair's book about the meatpacking industry in the jungle, was one of the main impetuses behind the 1906 uh, Food and Drug Safety Act. Hmm. Some of the most renowned geniuses in America of the late 19th and early 20th century, including Edison, Morse, Goodyear, and Ford all played the patent game, as you point out in this book. But why do you focus specifically on Alexander Graham Bell? That group that you just mentioned in Bell is sort of the um, exemplar of that group um, for, for a reason we'll get, we'll get into in a second. But basically that entire uh, club was the sort of first generation of corporate patent uh, thicket kingpins. And what I mean by that is until then, it had mostly been individual inventors and small firms who had claimed patents. But with the Westinghouses and the Edisons and the Bells, you had corporate research laboratories who had an entire patent division of patent attorneys that basically just collected as many patents as possible around an entire research field to block other people from doing research in that area. And this was a very new thing because remember the patent was supposed to drive innovation. And now we have it being used as a defensive tool of this new thing called the corporation in the American economy that flipped the role of the patent on its head and the court ended up approving it. And the landmark case involved uh, Bell's telephone patent which basically consecrated one of the great monopolies in American history. But it also enshrined this idea of the patent as something that can be used defensively by the modern corporation to stop research taking place 
And the irony of this is, of course, someone like Bell was claiming to be in the tradition of a Franklin, the great American genius inventor. But really, the practice of his company and his entire research lab was trying to choke off other Franklins in the American continent from pursuing his own lines of inquiry and possibly besting him in the field which he hoped to dominate and in fact did dominate because the courts sided with all of his claims which were extremely controversial and there were a bunch of Bell um, patent cases uh, they stretched on for many years uh, and they all reached the Supreme Court they were, they were one of the biggest um, legal stories of, of the of, of those decades. Fast forwarding a little bit now, vitamin D has obviously seen a resurgence in popularity since the start of the COVID-19 pandemic. How was it initially discovered in the mid-1920s, and why is it a good example of the deepening relationship between business and medical science under the guise of academic research? Yeah, vitamin D is, is the key patent in the turn away from a blanket condemnation of patenting uh, of nutrition and medical products towards what was known as ethical patenting, which is this idea that you could patent in a way that advanced um, the ethics, the traditional ethics uh, in goals of medicine. And the way vitamin D played this sort of hinge role is a very interesting story. Uh, it had been isolated in, uh, I think, the teens as um, an important vitamin, but nobody knew how to make it. And there was a laboratory at the University of Wisconsin funded with state money, but also by the state dairy industry. And a young researcher there by the name of Harry Steenbach accidentally stumbled on the use of ultraviolet light to create vitamin D in some food that was in a, a, a cage of lab rats that he was studying um, rickets, which was a vitamin D deficiency disease. We, they figured that out, but they couldn't figure out how to make the vitamin D to counter rickets. But this one cage of rats was not getting rickets, and he traced it back to this new experimental ultraviolet light that was creating vitamin D. He figured it out by accident. Now, up until that point, the thing to do, the ethical thing to do, according to the uh, how it had been done uh, in every case, would have been to publish the information and allow vitamin D to be made freely around the world, especially in places like Northern Europe, where you have these, these smokestack towns and kids not having sunlight for you know, six months of the year, getting rickets and, and other diseases from vitamin D deficiencies. But Steenbach decided he was going to protect the butter industry from margarine, which was the upstart industry challenging dairy products. Because if he was, if they were able to get a license for vitamin D, then they would be a cheaper alternative with the same nutritional benefits. And he was not going to let that happen. So he convinced the University of Wisconsin to hire a outside contractor to basically manage the patent and the royalties, which were considerable. Um, and this allowed them to have like a degree of separation and claim some you know, independence from the, the dirty business of, of monopolizing the production of vitamin D. Uh, this was a global scandal that broke the dam, basically, and, and entered and ushered in this new age of so-called ethical patent. Um, because they claimed they were doing it, uh, the University of Wisconsin and the organization they founded, the um, Wisconsin Alumni Research Foundation, the WARF, they claimed they were doing it to protect you know, the purity of the science and to make sure only ethical um, contractors produce vitamin D, but really they were just protecting uh, the butter, the, the dairy industry, the, the companies that made pure butter in Wisconsin. Um, and then other universities said, wow, they're making a lot of money and they're claiming the moral high ground. So soon you have um, Here's University of Toronto ethically patenting insulin. You've got uh, most of the major research universities following suit in the next uh, 20 years. What affected the discovery and deployment of antibiotics on the American public around World War II and into the 1950s have on the medical patent debate and farmers really, uh, their attempts to really profiteer beyond American borders? Yes. Um, 
Penicillin is probably the most famous scientific uh, collaboration uh, of World War II after the atom bomb, um, the industrial scaling up of penicillin. Uh, and that was done very consciously on a non patent basis. The government ran that project and they licensed it out very broadly during and after the war, uh, which proposed a sort of counter model to what was becoming the more common uh, patenting of, of new drugs uh, and medicines. And penicillin continued to sort of serve as that counterpoint. And I think a lot of the American public didn't really realize that until the pharmaceutical companies that grew rich making penicillin for the government started patenting other antibiotics in the 1950s and jacked up those prices, formed cartels, which was those cartels were the subject of the first ever FTC investigation into the pharma industry, the first government investigation in the pharma industry in the 50s. And, and also uh, over over prescribing them too, by the way, to the point that you had uh, uh, antibiotics, uh, um, antibiotic resistant uh, infections that were starting to arise too. Yes, I mean the the problem we have now of antibiotic resistance was set in train as early as the 1950s when pharma started getting patents on all of these um, who were basically just processes of nature. They shouldn't have ever had patents on them in the first place, but they basically changed the patent laws to be able to claim, you know, soil microbes as their own. And uh, once they had the patent, then the more that they, uh, more indications, the more use, the more sales, then the more profit. And this was really how they, the, the basis of Big Pharma was laid uh, after World War II. And then when they were finally, you know, you know, the patents died off or the government stepped in and said, you can't over prescribe these things anymore, um, in many cases, it's dangerous. They just went abroad and continued to do it until, you know, even today. But uh, they were called to account for it beginning in the 1970s by Gaylord Nelson. But that's a different story. Um, but yeah, penicillin was, uh, was a great example of what many New Dealers thought should be the model of government uh, research, which is government puts up the money, it directs research towards important goals, social, socially vital needs, and then manages the contracts with the private sector. Private sector is allowed to make a reasonable profit, two, three times the cost of production, whatever the case is. In, in the case of penicillin, it was about three times maximum. Um, and then there was broad licensing of, of the, the breakthrough. You had competition, prices go down. Penicillin was never expensive for this reason, unlike the, the patented antibiotics that followed. Uh, but that was not the model that was pursued uh, after the war. The New Dealers lost that argument. And that sort of back and forth is the story of pharma politics, deep pharma politics between the end of World War II and the first Reagan administration, when it was finally settled in favor of monopoly. Around the same time, the uh, early 1940s, uh, another drug that you mentioned a little bit earlier was refined and commercialized, and that was insulin. How was it uh, one of those major fronts in the medical patent fight in a battle that was actually a part of a much larger conversation regarding monopolies around the world? Yeah, that was, insulin was part of the, the ethical patenting shift in the 20s and 30s. Um, it was one of the major uh, early cases in which the university, in this case, a public university in Canada, uh, said, look, the goals of science are being best served by us patenting it so we can control quality. We can stop unethical actors from patenting it and limiting access. They thought they were doing the right thing. But what ended up happening was a classic cartel emerged, which we're only not, we're still doing battle with it. The current infrastructure bill has a $35 uh, insulin copay cap, which is trying to bring insulin prices under control, which should have been brought under control a long time ago, considering that uh, most insulin products are based on very, very old technology, 100 years at this point, more. Um, and they can be made very cheaply 
So that that's another example of the ethical patenting um, genie being let out of the bottle and leading to ends that the regents of the University of Toronto never could have imagined. But critics at the time were saying, be very careful what you're doing because even though you say you have the best intentions, this is a bad precedent and you have no idea where it's gonna lead. So we have one outlier example of a medicine that is the best of all worlds, an incredible invention, uh, an amazing innovation, and one that bucked the trend of essentially being held hostage to line the park, uh, pockets of the pharmaceutical company, and that is the polio vaccine. How was the development of the polio vaccine paid for in a manner that really differed from all medical advances beginning in 1934? Right. Uh, polio was a horrifying disease at the time. It's hard to um, really compare it to anything now because I'm not sure we have anything that is quite as um, quite similar in terms of targeting children um, and not just, you know, a small group of children, but anyone it could be, it could be um, victim to, to polio. So it was, it was a national um, sort of annual uh, source of terror. And when the science began to bring a vaccine within sight, the whole country mobilized. Um, it was funded through the March of Dimes, which we, you know, you probably grew up with the little boxes in pharmacies and movie theaters. Um, but that really started in the 1930s. And the, the project was raised with public money, not in the sense that we mean it today with, you know, the Federal Reserve giving money, distributing money through the NIH, but actual soiled nickels and dollar bills um, were raised by people all over the, the country and went into um, the National Polio Foundation, which basically built labs and funded the work of scientists. And one of those scientists was Jonas Salk. And uh, when he came up with his uh, dead virus vaccine, which was breakthrough at the time, he and the uh, brass at the foundation decided to um, basically put it in the public domain uh, and let the government manage production and licensing and contracting. And what happened was a bunch of companies were contracted. Um, there were issues with them cutting corners and, and, and ended up um, almost causing a lot of tragic um, cases uh, of polio, but uh, it turned out, you know, they, they caught partly because Salk intervened and basically made sure that there was oversight. He never really trusted the companies, but in terms of intellectual property, um, they never got their hands on it. And they were just contracted with the government. They turned a profit, vaccine was produced. And again, this was an alternative model along the lines of penicillin a non-monopoly, non-proprietary example of innovation and progress serving the public good, not with the um, ballooning of Pfizer's or any other company's share prices, the primary driver of um, the development and distribution, but the medicine itself. And uh, it continues to be sort of uh, a famous counterexample, partly because of the television program on um, primetime television where Salk was asked by Edward Murrow, you know, who owns the patent? And he said, well, nobody could, could you patent the sun? Um, but I, I wonder how famous that will be in the, in the, you know, next generation or two. I certainly was famous when I was growing up, but I'm not sure if it's really, um, uh, maintained its place in the sort of American pantheon of, of one-liners. <laughs> Thank you for providing that reminder, because I think that is uh, one of those quotes that is important to remember for generations to come. Now, pharma's influence exploded in the 1950s due to record profits that followed price gouging allowed by medical patents. During this time, the federal government began to press various industries who seemed to benefit from monopolies like auto, steel, steel, 
Uh, you even joke that uh, bread actually had its day uh, in front of the Senate as well. And eventually they did get to pharma starting around 1959. Why was this especially bad timing for the pharmaceutical industry? What was uncovered from these Senate hearings? And ultimately, did it alter the course of how they did business? Yeah, you're right about the long list of companies that came first, industries that came first. Um, those hearings were led by Estes Keith Aver of uh, Tennessee, who was a New Dealer um, senator. Who he got most his early fame came from um, prosecuting the mob, uh, and he was one of the the first real television stars. Uh, political television stars of, of, of the 1950s. One, one of the ballsiest uh, American senators of all time, too, I have to say, considering uh, some of the different factions that, that he was going after, even if it may have been a little bit for the, the glory and fame of it all, he still exposed a lot of stuff during that. Time. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And he was he was just ferocious and and, um, you know, did, did not let anybody make it, you know, no, he didn't flinch for anybody. And he, that includes the pharmaceutical um, executives that he hauled in beginning, as you said, in 1959, two years that he ran extremely deep, extremely rigorous investigations and hearings onto the post-war, post-ethical pharmaceutical industry. What we now know as Big Pharma was then still sort of in the crib or learning to walk. And we didn't really understand, or the American people didn't really understand its business plan. And what Kefauver did was bring it to light. He's like, okay, what exactly is going on here where your profits are so unrelated, unlike all these other industries, even monopoly-based industries, are so unrelated to um, normal factors like supply and demand, cost, all of these things. You just have these, these profits that are completely unique in the economy. Um, and you also have access to all of this federal science, which is funded by us. And at the time, the numbers were negligible compared to what they are now, but they were still considerable. And his question was based on his exposés was, was why should the American people pay twice? The same question we're asking now, why are we funding all of your monopolies and then allowing you to turn around and charge us four, five, six, seven, eight times what you're able to charge anywhere else in the world, including other rich countries? That doesn't make any sense. So he investigated them on, you know, safety, on um, patent manipulation, forming of cartels, um, marketing, dishonest marketing, uh, all this stuff that we're familiar with now, he sort of put on the public agenda for the first time. And his timing was not great, unfortunately, uh, because in 1962, when he came out with his bill based on his investigation. One, it was right on the cusp of the Cuban Missile Crisis, but the Kennedy White House was also very busy with Berlin and the civil rights movement. And it basically said, look, we can't take on the pharmaceutical industry right now. We just, we just can't do it. We basically, we agree with you. Um, this is a problem, but your, your bill is pretty much dead on arrival. And it was then that a safety scandal broke, which salvaged a part of his reform agenda. There was a tranquilizer that had just come over from, um, from Europe, and there was uh, a government push to have it approved quickly. But one of the government scientists who was looking at the data uh, provided by the company that had the license on this tranquilizer called thalidomide, was, she was un, unconvinced. And it turned out that because she had slowed down the approval process, she saved a lot of uh, anguish and um, lives because it turned out that the main indication of this tranquilizer was uh, anxiety relief for pregnant women. And in Europe, that had caused an enormous number of so-called flipper babies, um, children with stunted limbs. And... Uh, and she was a national hero. And she also brought Keith Hover's bill back from the dead, but only the safety uh, and FDA review piece of it. The patent and monopoly stuff was just completely cut out. So we have a, a 62 Keith Hover amendment, um, but the amendments bill, but we don't have the patent and monopoly 
uh, reforms that he sought. And that would continue uh, over the following decades up to the present through a number of his um, ac acolytes, beginning with uh, Gaylord Nelson and Ed Kennedy and a bunch of others. Partially as a result of these hearings and the ensuing le legislation, the drug companies put a lot more focus in the early 1960s into boosting its relationships with academic research and organized medicine. Is there a most obvious manifest uh, manifestation of the latter from this time? Yeah, I mean, that was, I mean, it, it's hard to identify one um, point of contact there, but basically the idea was the drug companies had overlapping interests with organized medicine, which didn't want government getting involved in healthcare, um, and academic researchers who now had a chance to make an awful lot of money by consulting with pharma, by claiming patent rights on inventions that had been funded by the government. So what the drug industry did, did was very smart. It basically brought these communities into uh, their fold, and they very consciously uh, wove their interests together in uh, ways that made them very, very formidable in beating back whatever the threat was to any sector of that alliance. When Medicare became an issue, the drug companies were there to help them. And when a senator tried to infringe on monopoly power or enforce some sort of drug pricing reforms, insurance and AMA had their back. And uh, one interesting overlap to answer your question that's worth sort of highlighting is the use of advertising in medical journals. This really brought in uh, both academic science and the AMA very tightly into the drug industry orbit because they were just funding the hell out of all these journals with prescription drug ads. And they were also giving out incredible perks to doctors around the country. So they were basically buying very powerful allies in the form of this, you know, um, you know, what has more social cachet or cultural authority than the family doctor or organized medicine generally that used to be the ethical gatekeeper suddenly are basically addicted to drug industry money. And they're doing the bidding of the drug industry under the name of protecting American choice and freedom and all the cliches that we're still hearing today. Um, the, you know, pushing that the lie that, that uh, the status quo is somehow the free market driving innovation. When in fact, this can't be said enough. There is no free market in pharmaceuticals because it's all based on government protected monopolies and government subsidies. I'm glad you mentioned those two examples because those are the brain children of Arthur Sackler. For those who don't know, he is the godfather of modern pharmaceutical marketing. And I was interested in starting this book, how much we would hear about him. And the answer is not all that often. I think there's maybe a mention or two throughout these pages, but that's okay though, because there are plenty of other fascinating figures that we get to learn about in these uh, 260 or so pages. And that includes an economist by the name of Dor uh, George Stigler. Who was he and why is he an important figure for your story? Yeah. Um, first of all, I, I wish I had more time to talk about Arthur Sackler because he is such an important figure. Um, he, and, he is, but but honestly, yeah. Alex, a lot of other people have done a great job covering him. So I had right. no issues with him not receiving more of a mention in this book. Yeah, but he was at the center of all of these strategies and alliance building projects, including the Stiglerian one, which you mentioned. George Stigler was a professor uh, of business and economics at the University of Chicago, which was the locus, as you and your listeners probably know, of a very famous intellectual project known as neoliberalism, basically, is probably how most people know it, um, or the law and economics movement, where the, the business school, the economics department, and the law department, basically, with the funding of corporate America and uh, drug companies at the beginning, especially, attempted to rewire classical economics in a way 
that excised classical economics, traditional antipathy to monopolies and patent monopolies above all, because the, the traditional laissez-faire uh, worldview had no room for monopolies and knowledge monopolies were, you know, they, they interrupted information flow. Um, they were unnatural expressions of state power. They didn't fit into that system. And what happened to Chicago was guys like Stigler who used to believe in that classical, um, uh, you know, barring of monopoly, they came around to the modern uh, Fortune 500 view that we need to get government out of economics, you know, except for the uh, issuing and protecting of these monopolies that are um, hoarded by, by large corporations and drug companies in particular. And Stigler was sort of the, the ultimate artist, not only in how to reinvent uh, classical liberalism to embrace monopolies, but also how to do that in a way that did not rely on getting rid of the regulatory state. He basically said, look, we're not gonna get rid of the agencies. We have to defend the monopolies. And then we have to essentially co-opt those government officials that we're stuck with and the systems that are trying to um, put limits on how those monopolies operate. And you don't just attack them and say that they're you know, evil statist uh, expressions of illegitimate power. You just take over their brains, basically. You, you, you become uh, you know, the, the, the air that they breathe. And you do this by founding new institutions, new think tanks. You build an echo chamber. You, you get a lot more sophisticated with your lobbying. You fund ethics chairs and philosophy departments. You fund philosophers. You make sure that you have a surround sound system in the culture at all levels, including medical schools, business schools, law schools, repeating your points. You don't just do what Milton Friedman did, which is write a column in the Newsweek every week saying, you know, regulatory agencies bad, reg regulatory agencies communist must destroy. No, you just take them over, which is exactly what they did over the course of 30, 40 years to the point where they don't even know it's happening. You provide literature that is funded by the industry, but not marked as such. And then it starts appearing as is, is, um, citations in important journals that the regulators are reading, that the scientists are reading, that the people who think that they are protecting the public good, in fact, are advancing industry interests in ways that they're not even necessarily aware of. It was, it was a very bold and far-sighted vision that Stigler advanced and taught at least one generation to um, to to continue developing and uh, one of his first real patrons was the pharmaceutical industry he held a, a very important conference in 1972 I believe which is in the, the chapter on Chicago where I talk a little bit about um, that conference which was unearthed by a talented uh, economic historian named Edward Nick Ka. Um, but yeah, Stigler was at the center of that project and probably had the most direct contact with the pharmaceutical industry of the Chicago figures of that era in the, in the 50s, 60s, and 70s, when, when they really changed the game for how pharma did its uh, propaganda. It's such simple but effective brainwashing, and there's no doubt that it's still happening, probably to a larger degree to this day. All those institutions that Stigler recommended be built and that were built up following that conference are still around, except it's part of a much bigger network. Right. And it became the template for big tobacco, big oil, climate denial. They all used the, the original pharma echo chamber model as their own. 
Big food is another example there. All right, we're going to have to fast forward a little bit now because I want to get to uh, to HIV and uh, COVID-19, of course, before our hour is up. On the subject of HIV AIDS, obviously it becomes an epidemic in the early to mid 1980s. There is a widespread search to try and find a cure in this country. National Ca- uh, Cancer Institute head Samuel Broder and his team searched an archive of drug candidates through a multitude of projects paid for by the feds, which all, they also developed a system to test the effectiveness of experimental molecules in combating HIV. They found immense promise with something that has since become known as AZT. So how did a drug that was paid for, discovered, researched, and developed by our own government end up as another victim of medical patents? That is a great question and one that was asked by Henry Waxman and many other um, pharma critics at the time in in the late 80s when AZT emerged as a monopoly controlled by Wellcome, uh, the the pharma major, British based. Uh, It was their US subsidiary that that ended up with the patent. Um, What happened was a scenario that had been predicted by the reforms of the previous decade, beginning with Bayh Dole uh, and other laws passed um, during Reagan's two terms in the 80s. And basically what happened was this, there was a a screening done of uh, molecules in government and academic labs around the country. And one was, shown to be promising, AZT. Not as a cancer drug as originally developed, but against um, against the replication of, of HIV. And the government couldn't find a partner. They could not find one company, despite all of their professed, you know, um, selflessness about, you know, forward-looking, life-saving innovations and, and, and you know, we, you know how they view themselves. Uh, they didn't want to touch. They didn't want to touch AIDS. The stigma around it was, was great. Um, the risk of failure was great. They just, they were happy to sit the greatest epidemic <laughs> of the post-war years out. It's always worth remembering that. Um, finally, the government was able to convince Wellcome to get involved because they just promised them the house. They said, look, we'll pay for everything. We'll conduct all the trials. You'll have all of our resources at your disposal. And behind closed doors, they promised them the monopoly. There's no other way to explain what happened. Um, So the government did all the work. Government researchers basically carried the football across the line. And then Wellcome uh, priced it at what was then the highest drug, highest priced drug of all time. Um, Well beyond many state budgets. Um, You know, private uh, insurance companies at the time were not covering it. And it was just like, uh, you know, people couldn't believe it. They're like, <laughs> you know, it's, it, it's like it took that much money to make. It was just an example of a company charging monopoly bread prices because that's what monopolies allow them to do. Um, and, you know, the HIV AIDS story gets worse from there because when antiretrovirals in the mid 90s are invented, then the same thing happens again. Uh, and that sort of culminated in the, the lawsuit against Nelson Mandela 10 years after the AZT scandal in the exact same array of forces, the exact same, the same scenario. I mean, it's just, it's just what monopoly allows companies to do and they're gonna do it every time unless the government, which is the basis for all of this science originally um, has the self-respect to enforce its stake and enforce the social bargain that is supposed to underlie the patent system. Like the reason patent system exists is not to allow companies to mint billionaires in crises. It's to advance uh, progress in the useful arts uh, and to diffuse that progress. That's the crucial point here. It's to diffuse it, not allow it to be squatted and controlled narrowly by companies for as long as they can possibly hold on to it to squeeze money out of suffering to grow as they put it in the 19th century to grow fat on human misery 
And another sad example of this that I was completely unfamiliar with before your book was the World Trade Organization. How is intellectual property and medical patents at the foundation of the uh, the startup of the WTO in 1994? Well, what the WTO did uh, in its simplest terms is it globalized the American system, which by then had become the only real country uh, to enforce uh, drug patents brutally and uh, without many exceptions. I mean, Europe was still behind, even though they were, were catching up. Uh, the US kind of had to knock heads to get Europe, Canada, and Japan t on um, the same page with the WTO because they had deep concerns, um, you know, this the ethical, um, problems were, were, were still slowing them down, uh, whereas the US had, had gotten well past that at that point. Um, and what they did was uh, come up with a legal regime and force the rest of the world to sign it um, that said, you will respect um, our drug patents in your national systems, or you, you know, this wasn't made explicit, but it was basically what happened in the meetings. Um, they were told they wouldn't have access to uh, wealthy nations markets for their textiles and agricultural goods. They would lose um, their, their advantages, which they've just gained in many cases in the, in the 70s um, before the Yurk way round began. Um, and then it culminated in 1994, went into effect the first day of 1995. And uh, it wasn't long after that where you saw exactly what that regime looked like in practice, which was um, at the height of the African AIDS crisis, antiretrovirals being withheld um, from people who, who otherwise uh, didn't have to die. There's a fitting irony with the WTO. It's that the U.S. Uh, gave China membership in the early 2000s, which has since allowed China to thieve quite a bit of intellectual property from American companies. So uh, I guess you get what you give in the long term. All right, we're going to finish uh, today, Alex, with uh, COVID-19. At the start of this pandemic two years ago, everybody was trying to be on the same page for at least the first couple of weeks for a month, but it felt inevitable that history would repeat itself with regards to the pharmaceutical companies eventually trying to make as much money as humanly possible on human suffering. Uh, what were the first signs that this is how things were eventually going to go with the discovery and advent of COVID-19 vaccines? Well, in the US, uh, the warp speed contracts had no, um, no pricing uh, terms at all attached to them. Um, there was no tech transfer requirements. Um, the U.S. government under Trump made no indication that it would support efforts like the COVID technology access pool um, at the WHO, and neither was any of the other uh, major countries with with vaccine industries. Um, so you can't really single out Trump at this point. They're all they were all on the same page. Um, but uh, yeah, no, it was pretty clear early on that the governments and the major uh, their major drug champions were were pretty committed to business as usual. But there was also a civil society pushback and there was a, a bottom up swell of resistance in the global south that basically said, look, <laughs> did we learn nothing 20 years ago? Um, why don't we try something different um, in this case and uh, focus on getting vaccines developed as quickly as possible, um, testing them in global trials, open global trials, had comparative trials, so we don't allow the private companies to run their own private tests and uh, conceal data, because um, this is a global pandemic and we don't know what direction it's gonna go in. Um, doesn't this make sense to just suspend the rules? And we could have done that through a TRIPS waiver. We could have done that through the COVID technology access pool, which would have been the best way to go. Um, and the wealthy governments and the vaccine companies basically turned their back on all that and uh, said, no, we're gonna allow the same old script to take place, which is public money will be transferred on a conveyor belt into uh, private monopoly products and um, prices will be set according to what the uh, executives and their shareholders that they serve decide is best for them.
Bill Gates has uh, sold himself over the last 20 years as a guy who, through the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, is just trying to get, get uh, cheap vaccines and medicines to developing countries. But how complicit was he in ensuring that the pharmaceutical industry was going to be allowed to keep these things private for the sake of profit, while also denying some of the poor countries on this planet from these vaccines? Bill Gates popped up in the middle of this early conversation between business as usual and uh, civil society in the global south. Let's just simplify it that way. He popped up in the middle, which is what he does. And he said, hey, 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 we can have our cake and eat it too. We can provide equity. We can vaccinate the world. We can make sure the poor are taken care of. And we can keep the intellectual property regime pristine and we don't have to break any of the old rules because the cost of that would be too high. He's always been committed to uh, the concept of knowledge monopoly and he has always been uh, a bit of a patent hoarder himself. But he, in this case, popped up uh, as if he was being magnanimous with this COVID uh, accelerator project where he basically said, look, if the rich countries just throw in some vaccines and you know, we promise to raise enough for 20% of um, the priority populations of the poorest countries. It'll be the same as if, you know, it may be better than if we suspended intellectual property uh, concerns. And it turned out to be a total, complete flop. Um, but you have to wonder when you look at the fullness of his involvement in these debates and in public health generally, whether his goal is really about making sure that uh, justice is provided or whether it's just to run a very effective interference operation uh, for industry because he popped up during the AIDS um, crisis 20 plus years ago. And he immediately, if you talk to people who were involved uh, in that at the time, they will tell you that when Gates showed up with all of his money, it immediately created a new, um, major point, a major uh, force of gravity, and it shifted the debate. It wasn't just the companies who didn't know how to answer the critics and the critics, which is most of the world, suddenly you had this third force, this benevolent, humane, incredibly resourced, brilliant Bill Gates character. And he has continued to play the role of that third force, which has distorted what is really a much more stark and simpler picture of right and wrong, effective in a crisis and completely inexcusably ineffective and immoral. And that's, the more I look at Gates and what he's done and continues to do in other areas as well, is I see him as this sort of interference operation who's claiming always that we can just round down the edges of the system and all will be well, when every single time the lessons point to that not being true. I feel like because we all know who and what the pharmaceutical companies are about, but because of how Bill Gates sells himself, he truly is one of the most nefarious characters in this story. I think it's hard to avoid that conclusion, yeah. Alexander Zaitchik is an independent investigative journalist and author. His newest book is another good one. It's titled Owning the Sun, A People's History of Monopoly Medicine from Aspirin to COVID-19 Vaccines. You can get it now wherever books are sold. Alex, thank you so much for the time today and thank you for this hugely important chronicle. Thank you, Trey. I appreciate it. Join me next time when I speak with Tony Zadra and Bob Stickgold on Wind Brain Dream understanding the science and mystery of our dreaming minds. It's actually my second conversation with these guys. The first one was outstanding. Cannot wait to bring you the second one. Thanks to Gentleman Jesus for the intro and outro music. Hear more of his work at GentlemanJesus.com. And thanks to you for hanging out. You can watch, listen, learn, and connect for free at BooksOnPod.com. For Books on Pod, I'm Trey Elling. Good day. <laughs>